Okay, our next named award, and this will be the last one in this morning's session, then we're going to take a break. This is the Elmer C. Burney Award. Elmer C. Burney grew up in Satanta, Kansas, and he became interested in biology at an early age through crossbreeding chickens. He completed a bachelor's and a master's at Fort Hayes State University, and then he did his PhD at KU under the mentorship of Knox Jones before joining the faculty at the University of Minnesota where he remained until his death in 2000. Elmer was a patron member of the society. He served in quite a number of leadership roles and as president from 1988 to 1990. Elmer was my major advisor, he was my mentor, and most importantly, Elmer was my friend. I am very pleased indeed to be able to announce an award named for Elmer. The 2018 recipient of the Elmer C. Burney Award is Jessica Melendez Rosa. Jessica is currently finishing her PhD in Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, where she is advised by Eileen Lacey. She is broadly interested in animal behavior, particularly in the fields of mate choice and mating systems. Her dissertation work um, used emerging genomic techniques to study the immunogenetics of mating behavior in wild deer, in wild deer mice with different mating systems, monogamy um, versus polygyny, polygynandry. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Puerto Rico and is excited to return to her alma mater as an NSF postdoc fellow in the fall of 2018. Jessica will speak on immunogenetics of mating behavior in paramiscus, a genomic approach. Jessica. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for coming to this plenary session uh, today. It is an honor to be speaking here, truly. And this is, no, I don't really want to. I guess I'm too bad. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I did uh, for my dissertation, which broadly dealt with the immunogenetics of mating behavior in mice of the genus Permyscus. So these are commonly known as deer mice. Um, so when I say mating behavior, I mean, I'm encompassing elements of both mate choice and mating systems. Uh, but today, I'm not going to be really talking about the mate choice aspect of this work, except to provide some very brief historical context. And I'm going to be focusing on the mating system um, element of this work, where I'm going to be talking about immunogenetic expression and nucleotide uh, level differences between mating system types. So when I say immunogenetics, this is uh, an umbrella term meant to encompass um, both genes related to the adaptive immune system. So these are acquired immunity. Um, and so these genes are responsible for fast antigen uh, specific responses to infection. So for example, your response to measles if you've already had measles. Um, but it also encompasses genes related to the innate immune system. So this is our inborn immunity. And is, this is our, um, our first line of defense against infection. And it is nonspecific. So the most important distinction to remember between these two categories is that whatever um, adaptive immunity an animal has is going to depend heavily on the uh, local pathogen community, whereas this is not expected to be the case for the innate immune system genes. So for this reason, today I'm going to be focusing exclusively on um, genes related to the adaptive immune system. And so probably the superstars of adaptive immunity are the major histocompatibility complex genes, or MHC genes for short. And these genes are broadly divided into MHC class 1, class 2, and class 3 genes. And so MHC class 3 genes are kind of less famous. Um, they're part of the innate immune system. Um, but MHC class 1 and 2 genes are part of the adaptive immune system. So genetic diversity of these genes is expected to be subject um, to very strong pathogen-mediated balancing selection. So diversity of these genes is driven uh, through exposure to pathogens. And the way these genes work is that they code for cell surface proteins um, that have a, a peptide bind binding groove, and they bind antigens originating from pathogens, and they present them to T cells, and they trigger an immune response. And um, they were first suggested to be involved in social recognition in 1975 by a man called Thomas Lewis. And the way that works, or is expected to work, is that these molecules um, get broken up somehow and end up in the urine where they're used as olfactory cues. But that's actually not, not very well understood. 
And so this suggestion sparked a lot of research into the correlation between MHC genes and mate choice. And back in the 1970s, a lot of seminal work was conducted um, in this field, um, a lot of it by a man of last name Yamasaki. And so they used um, inbred congenic uh, mice strains that were identical at pretty much every, every genetic position except at a single MHC locus. And under these very controlled conditions, they found that females preferred more dissimilar mates. And so probably the most famous example of this type of work is what have been dubbed the dirty t-shirt experiments. And you might be familiar with this work by Claw Wedekind in 1995. And so what he did what he, was he, um, he genotyped both men and women at a single MHC locus in this complex known as the DRB locus. Um, and then he had women smell the shirts worn by these men. And so what he found was that women preferred the odors of men with more dissimilar genotypes at this uh, DRB locus, and that actually um, scents that they didn't like um, reminded them of uh, parents or, or brothers. So all this to say that most of the work on MHC has been focused on the correlation between MHC and matrix, and it hasn't really been looked at outside of this field. There um, is a little bit of work in MHC in the context of social behavior, um, particularly in mating systems. And so um, the idea here is that, um, whoa, the, <laughs> the, the idea here is that dramatically different um, mating types or mating behaviors can have really important um, impacts on immune diversity. So for example, animals that are monogamous, they're expected to have relatively uh, low exposure to diseases because they're only ever in contact with animals within their pair bond, right? Whereas animals that are polygynandrous or highly promiscuous, um, an individual may be in contact with numerous animals of the opposite sex. So you have uh, increased exposure to sexually transmitted infections and diseases and other communicable diseases. Because MHC class one and two genes are part of the adaptive immune system, this is expected to impact diversity of these genes, leading to decreased diversity in the monogamous animals um, relative to some increased diversity in the highly promiscuous animals. So despite the logical link here, this has been uh, very rarely examined. And most of the work comes from humans, where you find that infection status may be predicted by partner number. In non-human mammals, work is limited to the animals that I'm showing you here. So Malagasy rats, deer mice, and tuco tucos. So, and these animals have characterized genetic diversity at some of these MHC loci that I'm listing down at the corner. Um, and they found that uh, genetic diversity of these genes is increased in uh, social versus solitary species and in promiscuous versus monogamous species. And so I was interested in revisiting this conceptual framework, but in doing so, um, with new molecular techniques that allowed me to examine the whole complex of genes, so these emerging genomic techniques, um, in doing so more than just a pair of species, and in doing so across multiple populations of animals. So more specifically, I was interested in answering whether patterns of immunogenetic expression were different between polygynandrous and monogamous species, but also whether patterns of immunogenetic diversity were correlated with also uh, the mating system types. So uh, mice of the genus Permyscus are actually a great system for this type of work because within the genus, we have two independent evolutionary instances of monogamy. So we have Permyscus polionotus on the, on the east coast and Permyscus californicus on the west coast. And so this uh, mouse, the California mouse, actually has a very unique biology. Um, as many of you probably know, most uh, mammals are either polygynous or polygynandrous, so highly promiscuous, and only about three to five percent of species are considered to be socially monogamous. Within these, an even smaller subset is considered to be obligate monogamous. So in these animals, offspring survival depends on both male and female care, and the male and the female are expected to have uh, lifelong pairings. And an even smaller subset of animals are considered to be genetically and socially monogamous. So no extra pair copulations and no extra pair paternities. And so that's where we believe the California mouse um, falls, is in the genetic social uh, monogamy. So the range of these animals extends from San Francisco all the way to northwestern Baja. And across this range, they inhabit a variety of habitats. So they can be found in oak woodlands, in chaparrales, and in coastal redwood forests. And so, importantly, 
um, across that range, they co-occur with a number of uh, closely related, highly promiscuous species. So namely, Permyscus maniculatus, the common deer mouse, and uh, Permyscus boilei, the brush mouse. And so, it's very important for me to point out that phylogenetically, um, the two promiscuous species, so the blue and the tan, um, Boilei and Maniculatus are actually quite distantly related. It's so actually added Boilei to this phylogeny. It's not even in there. Um, and Californicus and Maniculatus are very closely related. So um, this phylogenetic distance allowed me to more confidently assess the role of mating system in generating any uh, potential immunogenetic similarities between the polygen and species. So to sample these animals, we selected four sites across the California mouse range. Two of these were northern, two of them were southern. Um, and they were paired as inland and coastal, uh, coastal in order to incorporate some habitat variability into the sampling. And so in the northern portion, we uh, went to the Hastings Reserve in Carmel Valley. This is predominantly oak woodland, chaparral type habitat. Uh, we visited the Big Creek Reserve in Big Sur, which is a coastal redwood type forest. Um, we visited the Emerson Oaks Reserve in Temecula Valley, which is similar to Hastings, kind of oak woodland, chaparral type habitat. And uh, we visited the Torrey Pines Reserve, which is coastal uh, chaparral type habitat. At all four sites, we find uh, California mice, but the co-occurring uh, promiscuous species is different. So in the two coastal populations, we find uh, Permyscus maniculatus, and in the two inland populations, we find Permyscus boilei. So we use really standard uh, Sherman live trap methods to collect these animals. And at each, uh, uh, for each population and species, we collected four females and four males. And so from all animals, we collected liver tissues, which is a highly immunoactive organ. Um, and we use these for RNA-seq work in order to look at gene expression and genetic variants. Um, and in the end, we had 32 monogamous individuals and 32 polygenic dangerous individuals. So I'm not going to go into the RNA-seq workflow details, but I'm happy to talk about it later if you're interested. Um, but I do want to highlight some of the analyses we used. Uh, so we used the differential expression and gene ontology analyses to find diff genes differentially expressed between the mating system types. We used a weighted correlation uh, network analysis to identify correlations between gene expression and biological variables. And then we looked at uh, genetic diversity to examine patterns of genetic variation at MHC between the mating system types. So um, we annotated a total of 14,624 genes, and of these, 32% were found uh, differentially expressed between the mating systems. Importantly, we find that MHC class 1 protein complex is overexpressed in the polygen dangerous species, which is actually in line with our expectations. We can look at the expression profiles of, of each individual using a constrained coalescence analysis. And this graph is supposed to have um, numbers on it, but it doesn't. Um, it's OK. I'll walk you through it. Um, so it's, uh, each, uh, each dot is an individual. There are 64 individuals on this plot. Um, the blue and the yellow on the left are the polygenander species, and the red on the right are the monogamous species. The monogamous species. So, you can see that despite the phylogenetic distance between the, the two polygen and species, these animals have similar expression patterns. Um, so they're clustering together over on the left, and this clustering is highly supported. So we can zoom in um, to just, that was for all genes, but we can zoom in to just look at um, MHC genes. Um, and we can do this with a heat map, where here you have genes with high expression in the yellow and with low expression in the red. Um, and we have dendrograms clustering individuals based on expression on the y-axis, I mean on the x-axis, and uh, clustering based on uh, genes based on expression on the y-axis. And so we see the same pattern with the two polygenandra species in the green and in the black clustering together. So it appears that expression patterns are correlated with mating system type in this species. <laughs> So we then looked at patterns of genetic diversity, and we find that overall, polygen and species harbor increased diversity at MHC genes in general, but also at these classic MHC loci that are traditionally looked at. So this graph has a genetic diversity measured as pi on the y-axis, and you can see the two polygen and species are in the gray. They have greater diversity than the monogamous species in the blue. And so this is in line with what has been previously reported for this species uh, back in 2012 um, for the pair of species Maniculatus and Californicus. 
And so it appears that genetic diversity is actually increased in the polygenandra species. So we then looked at correlations between expression profiles and the biological variables, and we did this using that weighted gene network correlation approach. Um, so what that does is essentially find clusters of highly co-expressed or connected genes, and then it relates them back uh, to external variables. And so you can see um, that clusters of genes are given arbitrary color names, and you can see those um, on the y-axis. And then you have the variables, those external variables up in the columns. So those are related to location, so region, sex, mating system type, and habitat. And then in the matrix, um, you just have Pearson correlations indicating the strength of the relationship between that cluster of genes and the external variable. Um, so the hotter red is, uh, indicates strong positive correlations. So you can see that mating system actually has the only really strong positive correlation of any combination of cluster of genes and external variables. So we can zoom in uh, to that cluster of genes and take a look at what's inside. And so we find a variety of genes in there. Um, and a lot of them have immune-related functions, but probably the more interesting gene is the one right in the middle, this MDR1 gene. And so this is short for multi-drug resistance gene, and this gene is really important um, because it actually pumps xenobiotics out of cells and has a really important role in immunological and neurodegenerative disorders. And when we look at genetic diversity of this gene, we see the same pattern that we did for those classic MHC loci. So again, we have um, genetic diversity as pi on the y-axis and the two polygenandra species in the gray. And you can see across populations the same pattern, where polygenandra species have greater diversity than the monogamous species. Additionally, we find evidence of balancing selection in the polygenandra species, but purifying selection in the monogamous species. And so this suggests that um, Polygenandra species may actually have evolved to cope with that increased pathogen burden in kind of novel and unique ways that we may not be aware of. So to recap, um, our patterns of immunogenetic expression different between polygenandras and monogamous species? The answer is yes, um, or apparently. Um, and our patterns of immunogenetic uh, diversity different? Um, the answer is also yes. So what can we learn from this work? Um, the main point I'd like to highlight is that mating system type appears to be correlated with immunogenetic uh, differences, and these are both at the diversity and at the expression level. And these likely stem from differences in pathogen exposure in these animals. Um, however, future work should attempt to quantify pathogen load in the animals um, in order to draw a causal link between this correlation. Um, future work would also benefit from including uh, Permyscus polionotis, which is the other uh, independent evolutionary instance of monogamy in the genus. Um, and it would also be interesting to look more closely at this MDR1 gene, as it hasn't been studied in this context um, before. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in this project, all of my field assistants and my dissertation committee, um, and my funding sources, in particular ASM and uh, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. With that, questions. Thank you, Jessica. All right, we go back. We, we've got some time for a question or two. It is. I actually do have that line in there. I just didn't point it out. The dashed black line is baseline uh, genetic diversity. Um, so it is, it is a lot higher for MHC genes. It's not for that MDR1 gene, though. It's actually quite low, but, but yeah. Sure. Okay, one more. Nate. I'm not sure I follow whether they're exchanging genes between the species. Yeah, exactly. Like hybridization. Oh, I, I don't think so. Yeah, they're not. There's, I don't believe there's any interbreeding between them. Yeah. Thank you. All right.
This is not the end of the first plenary session. This is an intermission. There is caffeine.